What is PIP? PIP is personal injury protection. It's based off of the MVRA or the Motor Vehicle Reparation Act. Um, and it's compulsory in Kentucky, meaning that every person who has a car automatically has PIP unless they say they don't want it. Um, PIP provides, the basic PIP is $10,000. You all probably know that. You can have added PIP. I've seen added 10. I've seen added 100. You can, I don't know how high it goes. I never saw anything over 100, but it may go higher than that for all I know. Um, and it pays for lost wages. Uh, basic PIP on lost wages only pays 85% of the lost wages up to $200 per week. If you have added PIP, that increases and that's based off the contract. So it can, depending on what they get for added PIP can increase it uh, to where they can do it dollar for dollar, I think up to $500 per week. Um, some have different contracts than that. It just depends on what the insurance company contracts in for. You can use it obviously from related medical bills, not just whatever medical they want to give you. It has to be related to the wreck. Um, some insurance companies will allow you to use it to pay for mileage, uh, meaning from to and from uh, doctors, visits, or if the per all of them will allow it if the person is unable to drive and has to get transportation in order to get to the doctor's uh, appointment, such as they're in there with a brain injury. The doctor says that they're not allowed to operate a motor vehicle. They have a broken leg. They can't operate a mo motor vehicle. You know, those kinds of things. That's medical care. That's getting them transported to it. They will pay for that. Um, it pays for replacement services, such as you need somebody to come in and clean your house. Um, now, I've seen them do a lot with that, uh, but they are going to watch that real close because all of a sudden, it really is nice to have someone else clean your house and you doing it. And all of a sudden, I'm really disabled for the next five months. But, you know, they'll, they'll do uh, updates on that and they'll require doctors to fill that information out. You know, fill something out saying that they still need something for that. Someone mowing your lawn, um, if you had someone that was building something for it, like you were building something for uh, your spouse, you're building uh, a shed out back, and you have to have someone come in, step in, and take that over. That's a replacement service that can also be compensated if you're not able to perform that at that time. Um, is there a cap on replacement services? No, I don't think that there is. At least there isn't within the statute. I'm sure that some of the insurance companies will go through and they'll, they'll try to, you know, impose their own cap on it. Um, it's one of those things. Some of them will let you use it for a $1,000 death benefit. It's only $1,000, mm -hmm. so. Um, but they will, but then the rest of it, they'll let you use for replacement services. So okay. you, you can, you know, um, I've, I've had it, like I had someone on a wrongful death. It was an Indiana accident, Kentucky PIP. Um, Pip didn't care, obviously, that he's dead. Uh, so there's a thousand dollar death benefit that's to pay for funeral, it's towards funeral expenses, which you know mm -hmm. that won't even get you cremated, but whatever. And then the rest of it, he had back owed child support. They did it for lost wages, future lost wages that he would have had, and they gave it to the family for that purpose. Um, we had one where they were building a garage, and it was like midway through, and they they could use the rest of it in order to finish, well, as much as it would help to finish building the garage, they exhausted it on that. So you can use it for that purpose. Um, let's see. I said it's a compulsory, so you have that automatically in unless you go out. The next page talks about how you go out of it and how you get back in it. Or, well, there's supposed to be the next page, I guess it's too damn. Let's go, let's go two and then I'll go back uh, one. There's a, a Kentucky no fault form, and if you don't want if you don't want to be in PIP, I guess that's why I did it because I was explaining why you want to be in versus why you didn't want to be in. But if you don't want to be in PIP, and I'll tell you why, you can your pros and cons on it next. Um, you can fill out a form, and it has to be filed with the Department of Insurance. If it does not get filed with the Department of Insurance, then you have not rejected PIP. That's why on every one of our cases where the wreck happens in Kentucky, and that's really important. I don't care if you know, they're a Kentucky resident and they have a wreck in Indiana, you don't need to do this because Indiana law controls, not Kentucky law at that point, generally. There are nuances, but mm -hmm. we won't go that deep. Um, but if it happens in Kentucky, you have to run that no fault because if they reject it, our statute of limita limitation changes. So the basic statute of limitation is one year for a personal injury. 
slip and fall on somebody's property, dog bites you, get in a car wreck. But Kentucky, because they have this PIP statute, the MVRA says if you want if you want to agree to limit how you can sue somebody, then I'll give you two years from the date of your wreck or two years from your last PIP payment mm. right, to file a suit against the at fault party. So um, the reason someone would want to stay in or stay out is in the page before that. Pros of being in. One, you get the extended statute. You know, if you get a serious injury or something like that, you may not know for a year what you're really, what you're really going to be looking like anyway. So it allows you to kind of develop that to find out whether or not you even need to file a suit against somebody, or more importantly, you can get all those other ducks in a row so that you're prepared to move forward in more of an expeditious way. Um, <laughs> but there are threshold requirements. You have to either have, you have to have medical bills of greater than $1,000 in order, uh, if, if you stay in PIP, in order to sue someone, or you have to have a scar, a broken bone, or an amputation, or you've got to die, or you have to have a permanent loss of your bodily function, such as paralysis, for mm. instance. If any one of those things happens, you can sue the person. If you don't have those, any one of those things happening, you can't sue, even if it's all their fault. And you got 500 bucks in medical bills, so sorry, so sad, that wasn't met, you can't sue them. So you have to meet that threshold. And that's for every person, except for motorcyclists. And people who do not own a car, register a car, use a car, maintain a car in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Those are the exceptions. So. What if you break a bone, but your bills don't come up to a thousand dollars? You can sue. Oh, okay. so it's an or statute. It's not an and statute. It's not no. one of those things. So, yeah. So well, in the truth, <laughs> where's the comma? Where's the comma? So you know, the or is the thing is the important part. Right. So you can have someone who scratch it gets a gets a scratch and then <coughs> scar. I mean, it cost them. Two hundred fifty bucks to get their arms stitched up, and they had some antibiotics, and that's all they they wrote. But if they got a scar, you can sue. So you know, at the end of the day, and you know, that's kind of that's when you really kind of want to jump on it right away because you don't know how it's going to scar. It's not going to scar. Like if you're interested in, in pursuing it that way, um, but because you can't read. They get, but they give you the loopholes. Like, so motorcyclists automatically, that this doesn't apply to them. They assume you're injured if you, if you lay your bike down, mm -hmm. if you get in a wreck. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you don't do those other things, like maintain, use, mm -hmm. um, register, own a car in the Commonwealth, then that's the other escape, escape patch. But we never bother looking at it because everybody uses a car in <laughs> Kentucky if, you, if you're in a household or what have you. So that's kind of that's kind of So thing. you're covered by in-house like a house driver. Right, kind of thing. Okay. Or, or use or maintenance, you know, the whole, that goes along with that. Okay. Um, if you are out though, meaning that you've decided that you don't want to have to meet these requirements, these threshold requirements, and you want to keep your right to sue no matter what happens, then you have, you reject that and you uh, get a one year statute. You're back to that one year statute. Now a lot of people don't realize that you can have that rejection, but buy your PIP benefits back. So just because somebody, I have a case like that right now, just because somebody has PIP does not mean that they have not rejected. All right, so you always have to, no matter what you have, you always have to, even their driver, it's their own policy and they have PIP, you have to run that uh, no fault check with the MVD mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that, um, sign. sign off, to make sure that they haven't rejected that PIP. Um, and that changes your statute on it. How do you do that? Because I've never done that before. Oh, that's easy. It's good. Yeah, it's five bucks. It's a, it's a five buck. I'll show you that. There's a form that just you send off to them. Yeah, so you, you should always be doing always, 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 always. I'll show you that. If you haven't, if nothing's happened, good. Okay. Yes. But Murphy and I are tight and close personal friends. And his law rings, so mm -hmm. yeah, it will happen. So with motorcycles, <clears throat> almost 100% of the times, the motorcycles are going to reject it. Um, so I know we generally run motorcycles on a one-year statute. Mm -hmm. Do you? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, motorcyclists, for those of you who aren't familiar with how much PIP costs, PIP is not that expensive, really, for the basic stuff. It's really not, not that much more to add, you know, add PIP on it. Like, I have added PIP on mine just because you can go to the emergency room and soak up six grand really quick or the whole thing really quick if they're whoever's, you know, who gets it first and nobody reserves it, uh, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but motorcyclists, it's really expensive because they know that if you're getting a motorcycle wreck, it's gonna get used. Whereas cars are built to protect you better, obviously you're kind of hanging out free and easy. That's why most motorcyclists will reject PIP, and so we always run them on a one-year statute anyway. I, have, I still haven't run the MVD check on it to, to find out, just because that's a routine that you just mm -hmm. do that. That's one of those things that you make sure. Um, in case you find you know the unicorn and someone actually <laughs> didn't do that. Um, but yeah, I have one who he actually has pit that he did not reject it. Yeah, that's it. He's like, he, he's the unicorn of the wow. which, right. So, but yeah, because it's so expensive, it, it just is not cost effective. They're like, oh, I have health insurance, and that's what they plan on using is their health insurance, generally speaking, on that. So, what about pit, pit deductible? Does that just make the policy cheaper? Is it certain insurance companies that do that? Well, they can do it. You can do it on almost any uh, insurance company. All of them will say the bigger ones. You know why we discourage it like state farm all state mm -hmm. auto owners they're they don't like that kind of a thing but it does make the it does make it a cheaper policy but there are ramifications for and we'll talk about that there are ramifications for that deductible you know for you taking that deductible and the deductible meaning that like okay they don't pay for the most commonly is it's a thousand dollar deductible sometimes that's a five hundred dollar deductible they don't pay for the first your insurance doesn't pay for the first five hundred thousand dollars of medical bills that's on you then your PIP will take over after that. But there are problems that, there are other problems that are associated with that. Okay. So if you don't, yes. Is PIP run by whatever uh, insurance company you have? So it's like in State Farm in Kentucky, it auto, State Farm takes care of PIP or they automatically, or like Geico or? Right, whoever your insurer is, okay. it's a coverage that they have to offer. Okay. By law, they have to offer that. And when I say offer it, they have to automatically sign you up for it and okay. you have to decide you don't want it. Okay. So um, that's just kind of like in Indiana, you have to affirmatively accept or reject or reject UM and UIM, both of those things. Mm -hmm. Well, PIP's kind of the same. You have to affirmatively reject it, otherwise you have it. Period. That's mm -hmm. what it is. Unless if you're a pedestrian, you uh, we'll get, get to that. PIP. Through, oh. We'll get to that. Yeah, I want. I want. <laughs> then the changes thing. I promise you. Well, just to keep yeah, it in, like, just to keep it in line. That changes things. But okay, so on this form that I was that I was telling you about the rejection form, there are four options on it. The rejection form is also the hey I want it back form. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's all one it's all one thing. The first one says I completely reject and for myself and my household. So if you have kids, it's for everybody in that household. You rejected the MBRA, you don't want PIP, you're not in the PIP statute, and it's a one year. So that's for everybody. Number two says, whoever signed it rejects it for them, but everybody else in the household gets to keep it. So that person that signed it is rejecting it only on their own behalf, and every other person within their household still is within the MVRA. Okay. Three says, I want PIP when I'm in a car, but I don't want it when I'm on a motorcycle because it's so darn expensive. So they have that certain one for that one. And then four says, you know, I rejected this at one point, but I want it back, and that's that one. Again, it's not effective, though, until it's signed and sent back to the Department of Insurance. And it's not retroactive. And it is not retroactive. So <laughs> our lady, we went back, the one that she's like, I didn't realize we rejected this 27 years ago. And so we went back and we fixed it for her, but it didn't affect her wreck that she was in on this one. We were still on one year statute. So, okay, so the letter, I know Lindsay had drafted up a letter for the client to sign that said, I had rejected this so and so years ago. I want it back. And then we filed that with. Does that letter not fix this number four? Um, I don't know about this letter. I have always just, it, this is the one that they accept. Now we have no argument. I like the argument I don't have to make sometimes. It just makes it simple. This is your own form. You say you get it back. And it's really simple for them to sign it fill out the same stuff they filled out previously and get it sent in and actually end up sending it to their insurance company that they have currently and to the Department of Insurance okay. to both of them. Okay. Um, 
Another benefit of PIP, I like PIP a lot more than med pay and you know, shortly, um, one. PIP lets you direct benefits, meaning that you can reserve all of your money. You can, you can tell your adjuster, I don't want you to pay anything until I tell you who I want you to pay. And they have to do it. That's statutory. It's what, you know, they have no, they don't have any discretion in it. They have to wait and find out what you want to do with your, your PIP. Um, they can deal with it one of a couple ways. Oftentimes, we'll send in a reservation letter and ask for them to send it to us, as you guys know, so that we can just parcel it out. We don't have to wait for them to do anything for us on our behalf and then, you know, have 50 phone calls because they didn't do what they were supposed to do in the first place. Um, but, and some insurance companies will do that. As long as you give them a bill showing that they've incurred the $10,000 or whatever it is that you're requesting in medical bills, sometimes they'll just send you a check and say, here you go, put it, you know, put it in escrow, pay for what you're gonna pay for on your own. There are adjusters, and I, to me, it's not insurance companies. It's not an individual insurance company, no matter what you hear. It's adjuster to adjuster to adjuster. Some adjusters are like, no, I won't. You can tell me if you want me to pay and I'll pay it, but I'm not sending you the money. <laughs> so there's nothing in the law that requires them to send it to you uh, unless you're directing them to pay for proof on like lost wages. But then you have to prove you lost $10,000 worth of wages and it's really hard at 200 bucks a week. So it'll take a while. Um, you can use it to pay for your health insurance lien. You can use it to pay for lost wages. You can use it... Um, for treatment not covered by health insurance. Uh, you can use it for doctors that say, I will only do this if, which I think is shady as shit, but they do it all the time. You know, so that you can get your person in and they, like they're having problems getting um, the pre-auth required by their insurance company to get that MRI or whatever it is. You can direct the insurance, you can direct the insurance company, PIP company, to pay that doctor when that doctor's bill comes in and not to pay anybody else until that happens. So that's kind of the benefit of being able to do it. It makes it easier for your client to access care. Um, it also makes it easier for your client to get reimbursed for out of pockets, like prescriptions that they paid for, co-payments that they paid for, their own insurance deductibles, you know, health insurance deductibles and stuff like that. So, and it, so they can actually get the kind of care that they need and, and not lose it all to their settlement at the end of the day. Then, pedestrians, who get hit by cars <laughs> to get hit, but they get hit from the car that hits them. So a scenario would be, so if that person's, okay, so I'm crossing the street and Amanda, who's seen what her car looks like, hits me. Ten thousand is basic, and it doesn't matter if they're at fault. That's what I want to emphasize. So you're looking at at fault. 
Once oh, okay. you get the ten thousand dollars, the ten thousand basic pit benefits from a car that hits you, mm -hmm. that you're that you have your run in with, then you can look to your own via your own policy for added benefits. But it's not the ten in addition to. No, because okay. that's no, basic. You, you can't stack the two ten. Right. So it's, it's like, like stacking like UIM, right? Yeah. It's like it's yeah. like well, yeah. It's so well, you can't. Yeah, that's, that's why I'm like. That's a different. That's a whole different. Uh, We're not going into that. <laughs> yeah. Way too long. So you, it's you, not you can't stack the two ten. You have basic, to have like, basic is basic. You can't stack it. Okay. Basic is one time. But you pay for the additional. Well, I I have added, so I'm getting. You I get it. I'd be able to go back. Okay, got it. You don't have added. You, you can't go to your insurance and say, hey, gotcha. I want you to pay for me. It's, it doesn't work that way. You had. Um. <clears throat> so you get into an accident and you get the full like pit benefits. Does that like, say you get into another accident later on that same year, mm -hmm. do you still get the full amount of PIP benefits or does it change? Okay, you have to wait a year after that no, accident no, no. to get it's, the full amount. It's per incident. I mean, you might have oh, like okay. the special you investigations run. unit looking at you like while you're getting in so many accidents. I have some people that literally would mm -hmm. later to find out that that was kind of how they were making their living is that they have these little accidents. Mm -hmm. Or like three accidents a year, you can get three twenty five or ten thousand dollar pit benefits and automatically. Up to yeah, oh, you okay. have to remember it's an up to. It's not like a here you go. Here, let me write the check and you go. Okay. It's if you accru if you accrue that much in damages for to to be covered, mm -hmm. then they will provide that much in coverage. Okay. But if you, for instance, have a, I mean, I have plenty of clients that you know they've only go and they they end up with like you know seven grand worth of bills. And so, and they have maybe a five hundred bucks worth of lost wages. Well, now we're only at seventy five hundred. That twenty five hundred, the insurance company gets to keep. That doesn't. That's just how much. That's the limit. That's yeah. not the automatic payout on it. Mm -hmm. So, so like, oh, oh no, sorry. So if the car that hits the pedestrian has no insurance, yes. pedestrian has no auto insurance. No one in the household has auto insurance. Is that a KAC situation or no with a pedestrian? It is a KAC situation. Anytime there's a car involved. Right. Okay. It is a KAC situation. Okay. Um, and when we get to K, I'll, we'll talk about more about how KAC works at the very end because it just, it just it's easier to talk about this now than MedPay and then KAC because okay. KAC is completely its own animal in so many different ways. So I, uh, just like the, just because I had a case like with this, so our client was a pedestrian. But they were sitting in a restaurant and the car came through. It would be kind of like where we're sitting right now. Mm -hmm. And the car came through and to it. But the client never actually hit the car. Mm. So That's because really they didn't actually hit the car, the car, the body, our client's body never hit the car. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. She did not get hit. From the car, even though the car created the hazard, yes, that right. created because the injury the, because the her body did not hit the car. The car. So yeah, so I'm gonna let you explain. Well, it. yeah, okay. So that, that actually brings up here's a more common scenario. That's an unusual scenario, but it's a good one. Yeah. So it it is the the controlling language is the vehicle that strikes the pedestrian. Mm -hmm. So for instance, mm -hmm. I had a client who he's changing his tire at the side of the road on his own vehicle. And a car comes by, sideswipes his vehicle. His vehicle is the one that hits him, and he goes tumbling down into this ravine. His car is the one that actually hits him, so his car is the one that's actually giving him the pit benefits, not the car that hit his car that hit him. So it's the one that actually makes the physical contact. That is the vehicle that provides the pit benefits. Mm -hmm. So... But if there is no physical contact between, it, there, it still is, it's still within, the, as soon as PIP makes a payment, you're still within that MVRA we talked about. So it's it's still, if you are if you haven't rejected it, you still get that two year and then two years from the last PIP payment um, because it's in the use maintenance, you know, of the vehicle. So is that a premises type case with, the, with use since there was no contact? No, 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 that's an MVRA, that's a motor vehicle. That's still a, a regular one because it's just how the it's just how those basic reparation benefits mm -hmm. that PIP or MedPay that's just how that operates. It only mm -hmm. operates if the vehicle physically touches. She got it from her own the car pedestrian. because her car touched her. Because no, she so no car hit, actually touched her. A car caused the wreck. Right. Yeah. But for that car to provide benefits to a pedestrian, which is what she would be since she wasn't in her vehicle in a vehicle right. at the time. 
that she, that car would actually have to physically touch her. Right. Since it didn't physically touch her, she's still entitled to pit benefits. Right. She's just not entitled to them from that from car. that from the car that caused it. So she, she had, would then had go to, to her car, which is what Amanda's question was. So okay. first, so yeah. then she would go to her car benefits yeah. first, her household benefits. If she didn't have a car, if her husband did, or parent, you know, a child, or parents do, or what have you, goes to their household for pit benefits. And then if their household doesn't have any PIT benefits, they're not covered under any policy, then you go to Kentucky Assigned Claims, which is that KAC that mm -hmm. Amanda was talking right. about. Yeah. Uh, because Kentucky has a special program for people who are not otherwise covered under PIP. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. So one of the nice things about PIP, although it's a pain in the ass to get it, uh, is that it, PIP has a duty to pay all of its claims within 30 days as they're presented. Providing that you haven't like reserved PIP and said, I don't want you to pay anything until, you know, as claims are presented, they should be paid within 30 days. If they are not paid within 30 days, PIP owes interest. Now they do pay interest, and there's two different types of interest that they pay. They pay 12% for on the 31st day if they um, if they haven't made those payments from the time that they get it. Uh, for if, it, if there's a reasonable, if there's a reason behind the delay, like a, uh, you know something that was not ridiculous. If there's no reason, no uh, what's the language, reasonable foundation. If there's no reasonable foundation for the delay, then it's 18%. Hmm. So sometimes when they do these pip, uh, these pip claim or pip actions, which you know we don't do very often because they're a pain in the ass. Um, you know, you, there are other things that you can get, but you're always looking at the 18%. You want them to give, it's unreasonable. You're, you're alleging basically what they've done is unreasonable, so they have to pay 18% from the day 31 forward. Who do they pay that out to? Well, some insurance companies will pay it to the provider, and some of them will pay it to the, to the person, and VRA is silent on that. Hmm. I was gonna ask the same question, because I've had several that pay it to the client, and then I just had one that paid it to the, the provider. provider. I mean, if you, logic would tell you it's the one that it's owed to, mm -hmm. but, you know, I, I have seen them do that, where they pay it to the client, and again, that's not within the MVRA, it doesn't state that, and I think I'm doing a case law search on it, I don't think there is any case law that actually addresses it, because it's not addressed within the statute. If the interest is less, like, say it's not, there's not reasonable foundation for it being okay. delayed, and the interest the hospital is charging is 10%. Well, they still pay out the full 18, and mm -hmm. then can the difference go to the client for any things on credit, or is there any... Well, there's no direction of interest, because that's a penalty to the insurance company. Okay, I got you. So, uh, they, they, and they're statutorily have to pay the 18. Like, it's not, it's not like, oh, it doesn't matter what what the the interest rate is on, like, the credit card that they paid it on, oh, okay. or something like that. So it's, it's not just 18, 18. It's, it's 18. 18 for for lack of reasonable foundation, okay. 12 for reasonable foundation. Well, you were gonna, I, I, you, you've like done this. Well, I mean, you, wanna, you guys have um, important questions. Mine was just, what is, you know, a reasonable foundation, what would that be? So, uh, a reasonable foundation might be that they were trying to get medical records or bills or something in order for them to support that that's actually a, a payment that should be made. A client has asserted that it's treatment related to uh, the wreck, but they might have questions because there might have been a prior wreck. Like you said, mm -hmm. you know, they had something else. And like, are we sure that this is related? Let's see what the doctor says. That would be something that's reasonable for them to wait to pay. Unreasonable is, you know, I want you to fill out this extra form. I want this. I didn't see this. I didn't, you know, it just delay, 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 delay. Lazy, lazy, lazy. I dropped the ball. Unreasonable. Mm -hmm. Yours. Um, so... Whenever they pay directly to the client, it's silent on that. Do they? Is it like a check form that goes automatically to the client? Is it something set up in escrow? It, it's a check form, and it either goes to the in terms of the interest, either is either a check that goes to the client or it's a check that goes to the provider. Okay. And usually, you, more often than not, it does go to the provider. I've seen them a lot more going to the provider. It's just tacked onto the initial payment that they're supposed they to. They do make. like a reimbursement or something. They, no, they'll like say the say the bill was you know eighty five bucks and they their interest is calculated down to like four sixty two. So they'll pay them eighty nine sixty two instead of paying them the eighty five dollars in reimbursement. Oh, okay. Which actually I don't have this in here, but that does bring me up to um, a different thing. So how. PIP reimburses providers. This is one thing I don't like about PIP. PIP has a has a tendency to do a dollar for dollar reimbursement on medical 
on medical costs. So whatever the fee is, that's what the, whatever the, whatever the bill is, that's what they write the check to. Now there are some that have like Coventry Care or some sort of <clears throat> Three Rivers or different kind of programs that they're within. So there may be times when they actually do get some sort of a discount. Um, but that's why it's really included. I always tell my clients, like if they're, especially if they're going to physical therapy or they're going to um, uh, to chiropractor. Pretend that you're paying for this out of your own pocket <laughs> because they will run that till it's dry and send you on your way and you're out of crib without a paddle. And now, hope, or if you have health insurance, make sure you're going to somebody who's in network and have them use your insurance because you can direct HIP to reimburse your insurance. Particularly if you have somebody who has like a significant injury and they're going to need those benefits for those deductibles because most of the deductibles now are very high. They can, you know. 3,000, 6,000, you know, 7,000, 10,000, that's, you know, they're, they're enormous. And if it's gonna be something like, God, you know, their, their wreck happens in November, and they're still treating in February, now they've hit that deductible twice if nothing else had happened the year before. So they, they're gonna need those benefits, that's kind of it. And there are several providers that, like Highfield Open MRI, mm -hmm. are now having clients sign off getting not to build their health insurance so they can get that entire kit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. Even if they can bill them and get and dollar for dollar. Send a bill to PIP, have them direct payment to you, hold an escrow, then all, they have to bill health insurance. They accept it. But Once they're the having, is, yeah, but they're having a client they're sign having off. Sign. Yeah, it's really shady. And it's coming, it's been directed by one of the Activos I mean, so it's one of those is, is, has stirred that pot up. Well, it, yeah, you gotta kind of, Educating our clients mm -hmm. is kind of the part of, part of our responsibility is to educate them on how they can like you tell them like these are your they don't they, people go into their uh, their insurance agent expecting their insurance agent to do right by them and do the best thing for them. Half the time, the insurance agent doesn't even know what they're selling someone. They don't know how it works. They don't know what it's for. They don't know, you know they don't know how to. Um, or make sure that they access the type of care or how it's going to work after it starts paying on it. Mm -hmm. So, Bob never started, started, uh, sent them the wrong way, and that's probably always true, but Bob also doesn't know what the hell he's doing when it comes to after the wreck happens. He only knows what happens before the wreck happens, mm -hmm. like you pay your premium next, and I get my commission on it. So, you know, letting the clients know that they do have a right to they hear this all the time to go to providers. It's fraud, it's a fraud if we, this is a car accident, it's a fraud if we bill Medicare, it's a fraud if we bill Medicaid, it's a fraud if we bill their health insurance because a motor vehicle wreck happened. No, it's not. They pay for benefits, they're entitled to user benefits. There is, um, there is uh, uh, an opinion out right now, I'm losing the KR opinion out right now, that says, you know, absolutely, you can be, you can direct your PIP to pay your health insurance. So they're acknowledging that you got two different, you have two different insurance companies, and you can use one to pay the other. So you know, that's so let clients know that they're. I don't want my insurance. I had an adjuster tell me that they weren't allowed to cover an ERISA lien. I said, really? Please send me the. Well, there's the language. <laughs> yeah. I have an opinion I can send to you that clearly yeah. shows that that's yeah. incorrect. That I was like, really? Right. Hey. Yeah, she's just adamant. I was like, I'd love to see the language on that, please. How does PIP, is there a balance billing thing with PIP if PIP only is able to make a partial payment or like what does that look like? Okay, yeah. Okay, the mal okay, so if there is a contract, they can't balance bill. Okay. So for instance, um, you know, and there's like still PIP left, they can't, they can't just go ahead and balance bill the client. Okay. okay. But they can, I mean, they can balance bill if it exhausts and there's still money and there's still a bill left over, like if the PIPs is, has exhausted. So I think that's what a lot of people don't. Okay. So they, they, so do, they do EORs too. And if you get the EOR, they have at the bottom like a little asterisk that says if you cash this check, you are agreeing to our contracted amount. I've gotten that to send to providers and highlighted that. Okay. And then like, I mean, they you can cash this check. You agree to this write-off, but that's like a check release. Honestly, it's not. It's not worth the paper that it's written on. But they don't know it, and it usually ends up working. Yeah, <laughs> we're gonna. That was my question. Yeah, that is a like, bill for ten grand. Say Pitt pays eighty five hundred. Mm -hmm. Really, they should 
break the balance off because insurance isn't going to pay close to that. But right. is it just there's no? Well, this is kind of one of the that I, well, this is really kind of getting. I used to do all this shit, which is very good reason I'm having to. Okay, so <laughs> so coordination of benefits. We all love to hear about coordination of benefits. So usually insurance follows will follow the um, insurer that pays first. So. Say your, your client is insured by two different health insurances. Uh, usually the one that's primary is the person who has the insurance that, whose birthday comes first in the year. So with my parents, my mom's birthday came first in the year, my dad's came second. My mom's was always primary, my dad's was always secondary when they were covering you know, both of us. So in theory, if there's a contract for PIP mm -hmm. also, or MedPay, it makes no difference on it, and, and it exhausts, um, they end up they exhaust before they actually fulfill that contract. Then the secondary insurance, which would be the health insurance, if, if one paid first, is supposed to follow coordination of benefits, whatever the first one, whatever they whatever they would have reversed would be, which sucks because they always reimburse more mm -hmm. than what you're gonna get from your own uh, health insurance. I have, but, but, and they will do that up to the full amount of the bill. Um, but if they would only pay, this is like when Medicaid comes in and Medicare pays something like that. If they would only have paid, you know, $2,500 and the provider already got $7,500, mm -hmm. then they will write that off. Okay. Okay. So, thanks. So there you go. Um, so any other questions? Thanks. I did this one. So yeah, I put I, I actually changed this title many times. <laughs> <laughs> so med, med pay, I don't like med pay. Um, it had there are pros to it, but not a ton of them. So med pay only pays for medical bills. Med stands for medical payment uh, benefits. That's exactly what it is. They will pay for medical bills. They will also pay it as a death benefit. Every insurance company I've dealt with so far will pay the entirety of mm -hmm. the medical, of the med pay out as a death benefit. Um, probably because you're gonna be paying for a funeral anyway. And they know that. So, and it's, I mean, they would bet, let's be honest. Mm -hmm. Med pay is not compulsory like PIP is, so you have to affirmatively get into it. You're not automatically in, you're automatically out, you have to ask to be in, and it comes in a variety of looks. There is excess med pay. Excess med pay pays only after health insurance pays, um, or other insurer, other no-fault benefits if there were other no-fault benefits. There is, uh, there are two exceptions to that, uh, and those are government benefits. So, for instance, Medicaid and Medicare. Those are deemed to be payers of last resort, both of them are. So uh, MedPay that's excess cannot shift its responsibility over to Medicare or Medicaid. And so you have to sign in that, you have to have them fill out an affidavit and send it in showing that they have Medicare and Medicaid and no other insurance and then it'll pay primary. But usually we're talking about 500 bucks. I mean, it's really crappy insurance mm -hmm. and it's usually Safe Auto that does it or for Chicago. Yes. Is uh, MedPay run through your insurance companies like PIP is? It is. Okay. And you can actually there you can actually get MedPay benefits even if you have a Kentucky insurance policy too. I've had pers I've had people who have had PIP and MedPay on their insurance policy. Mm -hmm. Never understood it, but they do have it that way. So um, it's mostly, but that, the only thing you can get is MedPay in Indiana on an Indiana policy. There is no PIP there. There are only there are specific PIP states. Uh, Pennsylvania is a PIP state, Florida is a PIP state, Kentucky is a PIP state, um, but, but the vast majority of states are not PIP states that provide those additional benefits. The vast majority of Delaware is a PIP state, the vast majority of them are on Medicaid states instead. Um, but in Kentucky, you can have both of them on through like State Farm. Yes. If you, so. you can. Someone knocked on the door. Oh, did you guys not hear? No. I thought somebody was running down the steps or something. Did you hear that? Yeah. Yeah. It's like a rattling. Um, a lot of smoke. Yeah. Sorry. So, you were going to ask me. Oh, um, with the med pay and the pit, when you said you have them on both. Oh, yeah, again. This is creepy. Everybody heard that song, right? Yeah. Okay, it's not a good thing. 
It is. It's a baby tail. coverage that they pay for with that pit? Okay, wait, I mean, I, I've seen it, I've seen both Ben Pay and Pip on an Indiana case. Is that what it was? Well, uh, on a Kentucky policy. But yeah, you, I, I've okay. seen both Ben Pay and Pip on an gotcha. Indiana case because they had a Kentucky policy. Right. Or because they were in a motor, they were in an Indiana car and they were residents of Kentucky, so they also had their own pit coverages. And that's the stuff that, that's what they pay into, correct? Outside of the tent, it's automatic. Right, gotcha. Exactly. For Medicaid, you have to ask for that one. So, yeah. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. You don't see that. What? No, I just don't have any work for it right now. Uh, Medicaid, you can't direct benefits. Now, some insurance, some insurers will let you do it. Uh, the good ones, when I say the good ones, I mean the good adjusters will let you do it. The ones that actually give a, a care about their insured. But if you get somebody on the wrong side of somebody, or somebody who's on a really bad day and decides they got to, you know, stick to their guns, they don't, they won't let you direct that. They say first come, first serve. That's what it is. It's a race to the to the pot of gold, and there's not a thing you can do about it. There's no statutory um, authority that allows them that allows you to prevent them from doing that. You can argue a bad faith, like you know, you're supposed to treat your your insured in good faith and work in their best interest. It is an argument. It certainly is one that could be very good uh, if it's a first party um, uh, claim, meaning if they're the named insured on the policy. In Indiana, privity matters. So if you are not the named insured, there is no bad faith. You could, well, if there's plenty of bad faith, you can't sue over it, is what it gets down to. Um, and bad pay does not extend to pedestrians. So where PIP gives, PIP you can get, you know, the car touches you, you can get the PIP. It does not, the same is not true for MedPay. Now, there is, this brings me, MedPay is primarily Indiana. And so I didn't put this in here, but now it's in a few of these things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let's say you are a Kentucky driver and you're in New Albany. You know, we actually have, pretend that, you know, Harvest Homecoming actually happens. And you know you got some you know person who uh, runs out in front of your car, or you have one too many drinks and you hit somebody with your car. It's a Kentucky car. It's a Kentucky policy. Mm -hmm. You have PIP. Okay. Your PIP does not extend to that pedestrian if the wreck happens in Indiana. Mm -hmm. That is a Kentucky statute. That is a Kentucky expectation. That is based after the MVRA, the Motor Vehicle Recreation Act, and the Met Motor Vehicle Recreation Act is a Kentucky law, and you get somebody in Indiana. So PIP doesn't go to them. Mm -hmm. Just for pedestrians. Just for pedestrians, yeah. Um, okay, hit them in Kentucky. No what shit. We're saying. Yes, hit them in Kentucky. <laughs> it's always better for it to happen on this side of the bridge. You don't need to hit in Kentucky. You hit in Kentucky or drag them across the bridge. Mm -hmm. is what I don't like to do. Yeah, you're going to hit Just remember that, that Indiana only owns 80 feet. You don't have to drag them across the bridge. You only have to drag them 80 feet over. Right. Indiana <laughs> only owns 80 feet of any one bridge out here. We own the rest of it. So. <laughs> That's what I like. <laughs> 81, 81 feet. Back, you know right? uh, it's really hard to okay. get all so, <laughs> Subrogation <laughs> issues. I know that Scott and Ashley are going to address this more, but I thought I'd just bring this up because uh, just as it pertains to PIP and to MedPay. So say your wreck happens in Kentucky. PIP is not a lien. They own their own right to be reimbursed. They have to do it on their own. You have no obligation to protect their interests. The statute says you don't you don't own that right. 
med pay is always a lien. Mm -hmm. No matter where you're at, med pay is always a lien. So I do, I've never had to pay med pay back in Kentucky. I have. Really? Yep. Mm -hmm. I've never had to do that on any of my cases. Med pay is always a lien. Uh, now, mind you, if you exhaust benefits, they don't, they're waiting. They're going to do the same thing that PIP does. You know, if you exhaust benefits and then by operation of law, PIP goes away. They're gonna. They'll let. They'll let that they just are sued. All my cases, they just severed it from the other side. Um, it depending on who it is. I mean, oftentimes when you negotiate it, you'll negotiate it like, or when a person negotiates it, they'll negotiate it exclusive of PIP and MedPay. Mm -hmm. And if their policy allows for it, then you don't have to worry about it. Okay. Um, providing that's what your release says, PIP and MedPay mm -hmm. exclusive of. Um, but if they, if the adjuster won't, and I've had adjusters, it's like, no, we only, we will only recognize the PIP. We're not dealing with the med. I, mean, I always mark mine as a lien. Yeah, it, um, it should always be marked as a lien. Right. And when the, when the case is resolved, it should always be addressed. Have you, you paid yours out of the settlement? I have had to pay mine out okay. of the settlement before. Okay. Um, now, that wreck happens in Indiana, it's all a lien. Mm -hmm. PIP is a lien, Indiana, or MedPay is a lien, uh, and it does have to be paid from the settlement, judgment, verdict, whatever it is that you get. The difference, though, in Indiana, this is the one good thing about Indiana. I had to find something nice to say about our neighbors across the river. <laughs> they have a couple different statutes that really help to get the lien amounts down. They have a, a subrogation statute that says that they, gotta, they have to uh, reduce by one third for attorney's fees and a pro rata share of case expenses. They also have a, a, a basically a made whole statute that says you couldn't be made whole based off of everything on it that you can work to kind of get a, a lower, um, a bigger reduction on that, so. So do you care, are you, if a release doesn't, can take your act, PIP, if a release doesn't state specifically exclusive of PIP, do you write it in or does it not matter? Kentucky rep, PIP, yeah. I always put it in. You always put it in, no matter what. Okay. Yeah. Always, yeah. Okay. Um, there are a couple of insurance companies that are pretty good about including it yeah. in there. Uh, AAA is usually decent about doing that. Uh, KFB is usually good about doing that. State Farm does not usually do it. Auto Owners does not usually. I mean, most of them don't. So I don't. I don't even. I don't even care if it is in there already. I still want to. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't mm -hmm. put that thing on there. Mm -hmm. So, which brings us to KAC, the Kentucky Assigned Claims. All right. Kentucky Assigned Claims offer its PIP. Uh, and it's a pool. Uh, basically, all insured, all people who are, uh, all companies that are allowed to provide uh, a right in Kentucky are a part of that pool. And so it's a random assignment. You have your client fill out a PIP app just like you normally would. You have them fill out the KAC form, which is a supplemental form. And that form says, basically, it's going to ask them, do you have any household PIP benefits? You know, anyone in your car that drives, uh, or anyone in your household that drives a car and has insurance on the day of the wreck? Do you have health insurance? Was this a worker's comp injury? It's just asking about other people that could potentially pay. And it operates as an excess payer, too, just like excess med pay that we had talked about. The only difference, and, and, and it does the same thing, you, it cannot transfer its responsibility to Medicare, it cannot transfer its responsibility to Medicaid, so that's no different either. Um, but if you have health insurance, that goes first. If you have, uh, if it's a worker's comp, you know, I'm, out, I'm not paying anything. You can get it from lost wages, though, because there's no excess on wages, um, or, or there's no like insurer for wages, usually. Uh, work comp will pay two thirds of it. You can usually get uh, PIP to pay the difference between that two thirds and the eighty-five percent of the wages. So that's one way to get your one your statute extended, mm -hmm. which is nice, and also you should probably get a little more money in it so they feel like you're working for them. Um, I have never there's one case there's one scenario that has never popped up for me, but I'm just waiting for it to happen. So on the wage thing when, it, when you're dealing with KAC because it's an excess coverage. So what if you have short-term or long-term disability benefits of paying your wages during that period of time? They've never asked, I've never told, and I would advise you to do the same. Now of course if you are asked during question that you have to provide a, an appropriate direct answer, but they usually don't look that far into it. Um, if you have med pay, med pay pays before KAC pays. Uh, I'm trying to think of what, 
the problems that we run into that won't be your, well, they'll be your problems eventually if you ever do this kind of law. Well, your guys' problems as much is that, and this goes to the deductible too. Uh, in Kentucky, the, if you are within the MVRA, that first 10,000 isn't taken into consideration in terms of damages because it's part of the it's part of being paid out. It's that compulsory coverage that everyone has to have. So when you if you were to go to trial and you were to present your damages, they could reduce it by that ten thousand dollars. Now they don't care if Pitt paid it or Pitt didn't pay it. And if you have if you have uh, if you're an Indiana resident, uh, and let's say you have Pip, most insurance companies have to provide Pip so long as they write in the state. Well, actually, all insurance companies have to provide Pip so long as they write in the state where it happened. So. Indiana Farm Bureau does not write in the state of Kentucky. Uh, American Family does not write in the state of Kentucky. So if your client has uh, one of those two insurers, for example, or for Chicago, or one of those insurers, for example, and they get in a wreck here, their insurance company doesn't have to provide PIP. Since their insurance company doesn't have to provide PIP, now you're looking to KAC to provide that PIP coverage. Let's say your client does have $5,000 in medical coverage. That goes first. That still has to get paid back because it's still a lien. KAC isn't going to pay it for you. And so, and the person who's the tort fees or the at fault party that you're trying to get your money back from has already taken $10,000 of whoever paid for it into consideration. And so they're not, they're not reimbursing you for that. So your client's gonna end up with less. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. If you go to trial, you have to pay PIP back though, right? Well, what happens is, like, you get a verdict, and then the judge will reduce it by ten thousand dollars. Okay. Yes. Okay. So that, that's like the one big thing. Like, um, I know, especially for people that were in, have Kentucky cases where we're getting ready, like when we're looking at our medical bills, if we're over ten thousand, we need to make sure PIP has paid the full ten thousand. Because mm -hmm. when we get a verdict, whether PIP has paid the full ten thousand or not. Mm -hmm. It'll be our yeah. our verdict is automatically going to be reduced by the full ten thousand, whether it's been paid or not. Wow. And insurers can get away with only providing you with nine thousand dollars in pit benefits if you take a one thousand dollar deductible, mm -hmm. because it's only coverage up to that first ten thousand. So it's up. That's that's kind of the, the way they get around it. It's coverage up to that first ten thousand. So that's how the deductible. Is that was in their language policy. Mm -hmm. That was in their language. Of that was in the statute. Oh, okay. And I think you started to like with the about writing in Kentucky. So like if you have somebody who is from Ohio, so Ohio is not a PIP, um, they get they have no pay. Right. But if they get an accident in Kentucky mm -hmm. and they have Geico, Geico writes in Kentucky, Geico has to give them PIP. So that that's with all insurance coverages and you and I we we had talked about this at one point. Pointing. Very rude. <laughs> <laughs> first or you can reserve one because one how is it so so I have a cheat sheet so I was confused it. okay well it's based off of whatever contract is paying yeah so everything is very that's very fact driven mm -hmm. so for instance 
PIP is going to pay first if you're a pedestrian struck by this car. PIP pays first, even if you have your own policy and it happens to be with a med pay. Because it, an Indiana person, uh, say they came down to Bardstown and they were messing around and having a good time, and then they were hit by a car, but they're actually from New Albany. Okay, and they have their own policy, and their policy has med pay coverage. They can still use their med pay coverage because they're hit by a car. That's still coverage available to them. Um, you don't have to be in your car to use your med pay coverage if you're paying for it. It has to be a, it has to be an injury related to a motor vehicle wreck, right? unless there's a specific exclusion within that within that uh, policy. And Indiana is good at exclusions, mm -hmm. so it's very contract driven. Mm -hmm. um, but PIP would be first. Right. That would be the first one. If you are in uh, somebody else's car and you have your own policy, their, whatever their coverage is in that car, that's primary, and then it goes to your policy. So that's, it really, it's whoever, the, the proximate, the way I would think of it is the proximate, the most proximate um, policy is the one that's going to pay first, proximate to the wreck. So I think, like KFB is a big one, it'll have PIB and then pay. Mm -hmm. right? okay. Yeah. So I think like we reserve on one of our clients, we reserve the PIP benefits and then they have 5,000 med pay. And so we reserved PIP for lost wages. Mm -hmm. And then, but right. we did not reserve med pay and we let that 5,000 exhaust. Right. I think um, that's what I was, yeah. On, on because, yeah, policy. you can reserve the PIP because it can pay the lost wages mm -hmm. and then allow that med pay to come in and pay your bills yeah. so you can reserve and force them out of pocket. Yeah, you can force it to pay anyway, but that's one of, but that'll, before, I'll, I'll but they, I, if I remember, they were like, I think the adjuster was like, well, we don't, I think at first they didn't want to pay the med pay and they want to pay the, They want to pay the PIP first because it extends the statute, it extends their obligation and, and it's how they look at it. So that's what they want, but because you get to direct it, you can, you can push it anywhere you want. Too. Um, but now, if we just no, go ahead. If we direct though us to reserve PIP and we're just holding it at escrow, how does that work with extending a statute technically? Well, it does. It's not as soon as it's okay. So that's what I was saying. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Um, actually, the three, the three things. Uh, so it does. So once once the check's written. And it, it, it doesn't matter if it's reissued later, that first check that, that exhausts, once that, that's, your, that's your last date, and you've got two years from that date. So if you exhaust it and pull it in, that's your exhaust date, and it doesn't matter how many payments you make out of your escrow, it doesn't change from the date that they made their, their exhaust, first exhaust payment. Um, but if that, and that's why it's, it's so important to make sure you get those letters in and you know whether it's a reissued check because reissued checks don't extend your statute and make sure that it's a PIP payment and not a med pay payment because med pay payments don't extend your statute. Some providers will not tell you like hey, if Chubb is another one that does PIP and med pay. Hastings does PIP and med pay, but there are, there are a few, not Hastings, KFB is probably the most common one. But, um, MedPay, since MedPay doesn't extend your statute, they don't always give you separate ledgers and say, this is MedPay, this is PIP. So it's, it's pretty important to know that. And then if, you, if there's any question, then the default should be the statute, you know, the first $10,000. You know it's going to be $10,000 if they don't have a deductible on it. Operate after that last, the one that hits the $10,000 mark, that's your date. Of the original check. Mm -hmm. Of the original check. Of the original check. And actually, that's probably not even a good way to go with it. You really need to get the statute out if you're not going to exhaust. You really, or you really need to get, that's a terrible, don't listen to that. What I just said, ignore that. That's a terrible thing to do. Because, well, what if, what, for instance, okay, they make three payments under PIP and the next two are under med pay. Maybe that hits the 10000 but you're, you got the statute way back here. So it, you've really got to, you've really got to have, um, some good information, and they have no okay. obligation to give you the right information. There's, there's a, one there's they, case on that. There is one company that puts MedPay and PIP all together, mm -hmm. and you really have to look at the ledger to look, because it'll say PIP, MedPay, and it, it literally is all together, and you really have to look at the ledger to see if it was a MedPay payment or so, a PIP payment, and I forget. So are you looking at an exhaust letter in that instance? No, the ledger. No, you literally there. have to look at the ledger to see which payment it is. It's, like, PIP is really, or KFA, KFB is really good at 
making two ledgers. One is thick and one is MedPay. I don't know think which company it is, but you literally have to look and see if it's a MedPay or PIP payment. Yeah. And then you look at the date. You have to look at the date. Like you really do have to look at the ledger. The insurance, okay. oftentimes what we would do is we'd send out a letter saying, let me know what the last PIP payment was. But there's a case on, on point that says they, if they screw it up, you're up shit creek without a paddle. So you can't really count on them to give you the right information. It doesn't make a difference whether or not it's their error or not. It's now your error. So you really just have to act in an abundance of caution. That's why a lot of a lot of people will file no matter what under the under the two year just to make sure as long as they're in just to make sure that they don't get screwed. Like first you, then you. I didn't have I didn't have a question. You were doing this. I was just doing this like this. I'm no, sorry. Kind of I'm cute. sorry. Oh, okay. so, when, so when they say two years after your last pit payment, you have two years to file like a lawsuit after your last yeah. pit payment. Yeah. Okay. Up to like Philip and I have right now, we filed suit within the two year, and then we amended the complaint because we we had an unknown driver. Mm -hmm. And then we did discovery. We found the name of, they finally answered and gave us the name of who the driver was. And then we amended the complaint, but we amended it after the two year, mm -hmm. like with the, from the date of the accident was. And then, okay. so they just literally filed a motion to dismiss, basically saying we filed the amended complaint after the two year mark. So mm -hmm. we are past the statute Statue. of limitations. Well, but, we would, they didn't even ask us was what's the last date of the PIP payment. Oh. And so oh, yeah. our last PIP payment gives us till December of this year. Okay. So we're safe because of that last PIP payment. Well, so even after, so say your car accident was like three years ago or something, mm -hmm. you didn't originally get, you said you needed to file PIP payments within 30 days of the accident, or they have to pay it within 30 days of the accident? They have to pay it within 30 days of the claim being presented to okay. them. So if, if and and the, the individual okay. claims, it could be a, an office visit, a prescription, okay. uh, reimbursement, any individual claims on that. Okay, gotcha. So like if I send a bill today to them, like mm -hmm. on, you know, and then they were, they've got 30 days from like today okay. to pay. Even if, if the accident the happened a while ago or? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wouldn't the and that's when the statute starts running is two years after your last pit payment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Even if there well, is, there be. is. So we hear a lot that there is. Uh, a lot of people say it's it's two years from the date of the wreck or two years from the last pit payment, but no more than four years. Well, that's a little more of a vague. That's not exactly true. Okay. Or rather, it hasn't been decided. There is. Um, there is a question because there are, of how. The PIP statute is written. The PIP statute says two, day, two years from the last PIP payment. That's what the PIP statute says. So there is a question because you have to file a PIP claim in order for you to get it within mm. four years. Okay. All right, so the question is whether it can be revived after the four years. And that's why they get that four year mark. But that is not what the statute says. The statute says two years from the last PIP payment. Mm. So. Um. So whenever you're talking about filing your complaint and amending, Kentucky allows you to amend one time without an MO, correct? Well, providing there's no response. No, no response. Just the same as no response. response. Yeah. And no then response with the PIP, you can amend without question up until it is exhausted. No, you still have to get you still have to get permission from the court mm -hmm. if a responsive pleading has been filed. I have one okay. that we're doing right now. Yeah. So, the judge allowed us to file our amended complaint. Right. Oh, that's what I'm, yeah. I was questioning, like, in regards to all parties, how that works. Like, you know, when it comes to the filing aspect of it, because I'm thinking of Indiana. So, with Kentucky, you have one time without a responsive and Indiana without a responsive, and then you ask M&O. Mm -hmm. And then if your statute with the PIP isn't exhausted, you're saying that you amended See, this and you is, still What will happen is you'll get it. You, still, you have to ask permission. Mm -hmm. You'll get it. If you didn't get it, then you just file another. You just file another lawsuit against the other party and consolidate the two. Gotcha. So the court's going to let you do it because that's a pain in the ass, also, and a waste of time and judicial resources and money for no reason whatsoever. So they'll let you do it. So it's mirrored. It's right. kind of the same. It, but they, it's, and then they'll just move to dismiss. Okay. Yeah. The yeah. Council just move to dismiss if they didn't agree. Gotcha. Which you'll just provide a lot, right? I he, he just basically just, basically just jumped the gun I, and just really filed a motion to dismiss instead yeah. of basically yeah. asking well, questions. Well, June is on research. Yeah. No. Yeah. No. So now we've got to go through all these steps and be like, that clears the I, I, I mean, I usually ask, we just ask 
defense counsel. Most of the time, defense counsel, I the one that we just did, um, you know, actually I have two? I have two I just did, in, both in Kentucky. Um, one was, uh, we had it as a, it is a UM complaint, and it had it as one driver, and that driver was based off of what the police report said. And then that person called me, we we're trying to get her served forever, forever, forever. Um, had a hell of a time trying to find her, you know. Not come to find out the police report is wrong with this spelling of her name, so we're gonna have to change that. And then she calls me and tells me, no, it's her sister who's been stealing her identity mm -hmm. forever. Her name is really this. Mm -hmm. And her sister was one that was married to the owner of it. So I amended, so I got counsel to agree to amend it to add the sister to it, too. I'm like, I don't care which one of it, which one of you has, we'll go against both of you, that's fine. Yeah. And then I have another one that after discovery, they're now blaming somebody else as a non-party. So because I'm still looking at my statute, I can go ahead and move to amend. I have good I have good grounds for it. Defense counsel agreed because he knows I have grounds for it. And I'm still within my statutory time frame to be able to amend to add another person. And so now I added another person in another company because in their responses, mm -hmm. or in their responses to discovery, they said, "No, they're they're the ones that opened the door. They're the ones that were doing this. They're the ones that had control." Yeah, we just found out one of ours, the defendant, is not the actual defendant. It's a completely different man. <laughs> 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 I got the information. Copy and paste. Like not even close. What would you do in that situation? Would you yeah. say, yeah. "Okay, amend it and just like take that other party out"? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, you can move to dismiss that party. Um, and then just file a new lawsuit? Or? We're going to amend. Just amend. Okay. Just amend. And then, like she said, we have ground, big grounds, so the defense mm -hmm. counsel is really not going to argue. Unless you're really completely out of your statute, mm -hmm. like, yeah. defense really isn't going to. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, yeah, they're going to. Well, I mean, if you're out of your statute, it, you know, the court will let you, the court will be like, there's a problem here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, the person will be like, you're going to. We literally <laughs> sent the PIP. Ledger to this defense counsel, and he was like, I still think I'm gonna go with my motion and dismiss it. Yeah, this wow. And Bob was like, All right, well, I guess we'll see you in court. Wow. <laughs> like, see you in court. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes, sometimes counsel just, they just really fill the need. They just really fill the need. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Ding, ding, ding. Yes. 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 Ding, ding, ding. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's the ins and outs of